Thank you very much, Oreste, for the invitation to uh, present a lecture about our work and the work of the field in general to your students. So I will talk about um, cell death and cancer today. Um, I have to make a disclosure statement. So I'm an employee of WeHi and our institute receives uh, milestone payments and royalties from Genentech and Abbey for the development of Venetoclax. And um, also I have to declare that we collaborate uh, with Servier for the development of MCL1 inhibitors for cancer therapy. So all of you will have seen various guises of this uh, very beautiful scheme from Doug Hanahan and Bob Weinberg where they um, indicate which processes have to go awry for normal cells to become malignant cancer cells and cause um, disease in humans or in animals. And resisting cell death has been a part of this scheme right from the beginning when they first enunciated it. Um, I'll present you the data that led them to include um, evasion of cell death as being an attribute of cancers that they have to acquire to become malignant. So I'll start with a general introduction into cell death or apoptosis more generally. And then I'll talk about the roles of defects in cell death in the development of cancer. And finally, I'll end up in describing the role of uh, cell death in cancer therapy. So apoptosis or programmed cell death um, is a process that has evolved to eliminate redundant or dangerous cells from multicellular organisms. It was first seen uh, already in early microscopy from Fleming in the 1800s, uh, but then the term apoptosis was coined by John Kerr, a pathologist in Brisbane in Australia in 1971 when he did EM analysis of cells that are dying. And he suggested that the orderly suggestion, uh, succession of the changes that you can see in dying cells indicates that it might be genetically uh, programmed. So what is uh, apoptotic cell death used for? It's also called physiological cell death. So it's definitely used for the regression of certain tissues in uh, metamorphosis, like the resorption of the tail in amphibians, um, the sculpting of embryos, like the formation of the um, individualized digits in, in us humans and in many animals. And also in adults, um, it's uh, required for the homeostasis of many tissues um, such as the skin or the liver, and particularly in cells of the immune system, apoptosis plays a very important role. Um, how did we come to a un molecular understanding of cell death? Well, it all started with a patient like uh, this one here. So this um, man suffers from follicular lymphoma, a fairly common lymphoma in um, uh, people above 60 years of age. You can see the big lymph nodes in his head and neck region and also in the axillary region. It turns out, as you can see here on the left side of the slide, that um, pretty much all cases of follicular lymphoma are characterized by a chromosomal translocation, the so-called 1418 reciprocal chromosomal translocation. The result of this translocation is that a gene that the discoverers of the translocation, Sushimoto and Croce, called BCL2 for B cell lymphoma gene number two um, on chromosome 18, becomes subject to regulation by the very strong immunoglobulin heavy chain uh, gene enhancer on chromosome 14. So BCL2 becomes overexpressed in B cells. David Void, we hide working with uh, Suzanne Corey and Jerry Adams. Uh, discovered the function of BCL2. So while until then all oncogenes, uh, cancer-driving genes, cause cells to divide when they didn't need to divide, BCL2 does not do that, but it actually keeps cells alive uh, when they would uh, normally undergo cell death. This is shown on the right side here. So um, cells that are dependent on the growth factor interleukin-3, uh, when they're given interleukin-3, they're all happy and living, shown in green here. Um, when the control cells are deprived of IL-3, they all die, shown by the red and yellow color, staining with PI. Um, but cells that overexpress BCL2, when you remove IL-3, they don't die, they continue to live. So this uh, experiment showed many very important things. It showed that cell survival is controlled genetically separately from cell proliferation. And it also showed for the first time that inhibiting um, apoptotic cell death uh, can contribute to tumor development. 
Um, this was then um, uh, formally demonstrated in uh, transgenic mice, um, shown on the left side here. So mice that express BCL2 in B cells, um, they only get a lymphoma at very low incidence and very late in light, that's uh, life, that's the blue curve. Mice that um, express another oncogene, MYC, in B cells, um, they, divide, they develop tumors quite rapidly. But if um, mice um, express in their B cells both BCL2 and MYC, by 40 days of age, the last mouse has a very aggressive lymphoma, as you can see on, on the right side. So this shows that um, overexpression of BCL2 or blocking apoptosis on its own is only poorly oncogenic. Um, the main role of blocking apoptosis in tumor development is to give nascent neoplastic cells more time to acquire other cooperative oncogenic lesions. So I'll now talk about um, the, the proteins that regulate apoptosis. So there's the pro-survival members of the BCL2 family. So this is BCL2 that I mentioned already, BCLXL, MCL1, BCLW, and A1. Um, these proteins share four regions of homology, the BCL2 homology or BH regions, and they also have a transmembrane region. And this slide also shows the crystal structure of BCLXL that was solved um, by Abbott Labs in 1996. Genetic studies in mice knockouts have shown that different um, pro-survival proteins are required for the survival of uh, different cell types. For example, here, um, when you remove BCL2 from mice, uh, the mice make it through embryonic development, but they die about four or five weeks after birth because BCL2 is needed for the survival of stem cells in the embryonic kidney, so the mice all develop uh, polycystic kidney disease. <clears throat> These BCL2 knockout mice, they also have um, abnormally low numbers of certain lymphocytes, and because their melanocytes die, they go prematurely um, gray. Um, BCLXL in turn is required for the survival of erythroid progenitors in the embryo and the survival of certain neuronal cells. MCL1 uh, knockout has the most severe phenotype. Um, it causes death of embryos prior to implantation, so around embryonic day three and a half. Um, conditional knockouts have shown that MCL1 is also important in hem hemopoietic stem cells, in neurons in heart muscle cells, liver cells, and, and many more. Uh, BCLW is important only in adult spermatogonia, and A1 knockout has um, very, very mild um, abnormalities, um, just a, a reduction in certain types of dendritic cells. So the second subgroup of the BCL2 family of cell death regulators includes BAX and BAC. Uh, they are the effectors of apoptosis. They are needed for killing the cells their structure <clears throat> and their um, alignment of amino acids is actually surprisingly similar to the pro-survival proteins, but um, they are needed for killing cells. They oligomerize um, the mitochondrial, uh, and they oligomerize and then they permeabilize the outer mitochondrial membrane. And that causes release of factors that drive the downstream stages of apoptosis. <clears throat> the fact that backs and back are absolutely essential for cell death is really elegantly shown in this paper from uh, Tulia Linston and Craig Thompson, um, where they made double knockout mice that lack backs and back. Um, these mice, most of them um, die on the day after birth or even before. Um, the ones that survive have webbed feet, so they don't remove the cells between the digits. The ones that survive beyond um, develop very large spleens and lymph nodes. And uh, remarkably, the cells, uh, as you can see on the right side, that um, uh, lack Bax and Bax are completely resistant to apoptotic stimuli. The third subgroup of the BCL2 family, these are the initiators of apoptosis. They are the BH3-only proteins. Their name comes because they share with the rest of the family only the BH3 domain. And there's eight of these proteins. The most notable ones are BIM, Puma, and BIT. Again, knockout studies have shown that the different bh 3 only proteins are needed for initiation of cell death in response to different um, cell death stimuli. One example is uh, shown here. So cells that lack puma are resistant to uh, DNA damage-inducing agents such as gamma radiation 
or a topicide, and uh, Puma and Noxa function directly downstream of the tumor suppressor P53, the direct target genes of uh, P53. The fact um, that these families of proteins work together uh, is shown very nicely on this slide here through genetic experiments. So I showed you already that BCL2 knockout mice um, all die early after birth uh, from polycystic kidney disease. If you um, knock out just one allele of the BH3 only protein BIM from BCL2 knockout mice, then none of the animals develop polycystic kidney disease. They survive, the kidney is completely normal. Um, and their lymphocyte numbers are normal as well, but they still go gray. If you remove the second allele of BIM, as you can see in the mouse on the far right side, then they don't even go gray anymore. So this really shows the functional interactions of these proteins. All of this work um, resulted in our current understanding of uh, apoptosis regulation, which is shown on this slide here. So the so-called intrinsic pathway of apoptosis, the one that I talk about almost exclusively today, um, <clears throat> the pro-survival proteins like BCL2, they keep um, BAX and BAC in check. And the effectors of apoptosis, when BAX and BAC are activated, they permeabilize the outer mitochondrial membrane. And then the caspases, the enzymes that um, cause the degradation of many proteins and the demolition of the cells are activated. Um, in healthy cells, BAX and BAC are restrained by the pro-survival proteins, uh, but cell death is induced when the BH3-only proteins, the initiators of cell death, are transcriptionally or post-transcriptionally activated in response to DNA damage or growth factor withdrawal or other insults. On the right-hand side is a pathway I won't mention a lot today. It's called the death receptor pathway. So in this pathway, the caspase machinery can be activated very directly at the membrane through adapters when the death receptor such as FAS is activated. But that pathway also can be connected to the intrinsic pathway by caspase A proteolytically activating the BH3 only protein BID, which then connects it to inhibition of the pro survival proteins. Um, as you can see in the red boxes here, um, uh, genetic um, mutations in components of these pathways are found in human cancer, such as overexpression of BCL2, as I mentioned, because of chromosomal translocation, or epigenetic silencing or mutation in BH3-only proteins, for example. So in cancer therapy, the ultimate goal, of course, is to kill 100% of the malignant cells in a patient. And interestingly, many cancer therapeutics that have been used for many, many years already actually work at least in part by inducing apoptosis. Other forms of cell death may also contribute to cancer therapy, and I'll briefly touch upon that. So the BH3-only proteins that I mentioned, they are absolutely critical for the initiation of cell death um, in malignant cells in response to many, possibly all, anti-cancer therapeutics that we're using. So DNA damage-inducing agents, uh, such as radiation or etoposide, they work by activating Puma, Noxa, and to a lesser extent, BIM through a P53-dependent, but also P53-independent manner. Um, Taxol activates BIM in a way we don't understand. Steroids like dexamethasone activate Puma and BIM, again, through mechanisms we still don't understand. And even novel drugs like the inhibitors of oncogenic kinases, like the BCR able inhibitor Gleevec, actually activate uh, BH3 only proteins, and that's needed for the killing of the malignant cells. Um, uh, these um, inhibitors of oncogenic kinases activate BIM and Puma. Current approaches to directly activate the apoptosis machinery by drugs are, of course, the inhibitors of the pro survival proteins. Uh, these are the so-called BH3 mimetic drugs, and the poster child of it is the now approved venetoclax, also called ABT199, which inhibits only BCL2. Other possibilities of activating for therapeutic benefits cell death would be agonists of death receptors, such as trail receptor agonists, inhibitors of the IEP proteins, which attenuate death receptor signaling, and, of course, activators of P53, such as the MDM2 antagonists. 
The rationale for developing a BH3 mimetic drugs for cancer therapy was that, well, <clears throat> many cancers have defects in P53, so a lot of the normal activation of the um, uh, BH3-only proteins that relies on P53 is not possible. So if you had a small molecule that can inhibit BCL2 or other pro-survival proteins, they would hit the final common pathway. Um, and this is a picture of how BH3 mimetic uh, compounds uh, bind to their pro-survival uh, targets. So this is the first um, patient in the world who was treated with the BCL2 inhibitor ABT199. It was a 68-year-old man with very bulky CLL disease who had failed many, many prior uh, therapies. And at the start, he had a very large lymph node mass in the abdominal region. And then upon um, increasing duration of treatment with um, venetoclax, that tumor mass regressed um, substantially. This shows the summary of the clinical trial that led to the approval of um, venetoclax for treatment of uh, refractory CLL. So you can see all measures of this disease, numbers of um, blood lymphocytes, the nodal mass determined by CT scan and infiltration of the bone marrow in almost all of the um, patients was dramatically reduced um, during treatment. This is the work of Andrew Roberts and John Seymour uh, at WEHI, the Royal Melbourne Hospital and the Peter McCullum Cancer um, Hospital. So I will now briefly touch upon other pathways of program cell death and very briefly discuss uh, whether they may or may not have roles in tumor development and cancer therapy. So necroptosis um, is a pathway of lytic cell death in contrast to apoptosis, which is non-lytic. It can be induced by the ligation of TNF receptor 1 and certain uh, toll-like receptors. And um, it is activated when the pro-survival signaling arms of these receptors are blocked for example, by blocking the IEP proteins, and also when the caspases, like caspase 8 activity, most notably, is blocked, because caspase 8 puts a break on necroptosis. So when uh, these parts of the TNF or TLR signaling pathway is blocked, RIPK1 and RIPK3 in the so-called ripoptosome become activated. They then phosphorylate and thereby activate a um, pseudokinase called MLKL, and MLKL can translocate to the plasma membrane and cause the lysis um, of the cell. Um, so a few papers have claimed that defects in necroptosis may promote the development of cancer, but other papers um, uh, say the contrary. They said they couldn't find that. So much more work will need to be done to resolve this, for example, by crossing MLKL knockout mice um, that we have made to cancer-prone mice. Um, so we, for example, also we found no evidence that defects in necroptosis would render malignant cells resistant to the anti-cancer therapeutics that we tested. But again, probably more work needs to be done in that respect. Um, some studies have shown that necroptotic death of malignant cells um, after treatment with anti-cancer therapeutics may influence how tumor antigens are presented to the immune system, in, at least in experimental mice. So this could maybe connect um, to how you can use um, immune checkpoint inhibitors for cancer therapy. But again, this is very early days and much more work will be needed by students such as yourselves. Pyroptosis is another mechanism of programmed cell death. It's uh, um, induced in response to intracellular bacterial infections and is activated um, by the so-called inflammasome, which, for example, can in, um, include the adapter proteins ASC and NLRP3. Uh, they bring about the activation of two caspases called caspases 1 and 11 in the mouse or 1, 4 and 5 in, in humans. Um, these caspases, they um, proteolytically activate the cytokines interleukin-18 and IL-1 beta. Um, they also proteolytically activate a protein called gastermin D, which can also translocate, maybe similar to MLKL, to the plasma membrane and cause membrane lysis. So <clears throat> other roles for pyroptosis in cancer. So, so far, there's no evidence that loss 
of gastermin D or loss of pyroptosis drives tumor development. But again, um, this should be examined more by crossing gastermin D knockout mice with cancer prone mouse strains. Uh, there's one paper that has reported that caspase 3, when it is activated uh, downstream of caspases 1 and 11 during pyroptosis, uh, may contribute to cytotoxic drug induced killing of malignant cells. Again, more work is needed for that. Um, and again, it's possible that pyroptosis may play a role in how tumor antigens are presented to the immune system and may therefore uh, be quite relevant um, to um, anti-cancer immunotherapy. Finally, uh, there's other ways that um, cells can be killed uh, that are at least in part um, programmed. So cytotoxic T cells, the CTLs, the mediators of immunotherapy, they kill, <coughs> for example, cancer cells um, by releasing perforin and granzymes. This death um, is thought to involve both um, elements of apoptosis, but also non-programmed lytic necrosis. Autophagy, while it is mostly a process that promotes the survival of cells under conditions of starvation by mobilizing nutrients and metabolites, um, has also been reported, at least in certain scenarios, um, to remove certain tissues um, during uh, drosophila development. Um, maybe uh, autophagy plays a role in, in the processing of tumor antigens. And again, that might relate to cancer immunotherapy. Finally, ferroptosis, um, which was reported to be regulated at least in part by the tumor suppressor P53. And it has also been reported to be maybe critical for um, its immuno, uh, for its tumor suppressive function. Again, that has been questioned by some papers, so much more work uh, will be needed. So the future perspectives, um, the way I see them at least, is well, <clears throat> now with having BH3 mimetic drugs approved, like venetoclax, and some in clinical trials, like the MCL1 inhibitors, we can start to test their effect on cancers by using them in combination with other drugs, or maybe different BH3 mimetic drugs together, such as um, inhibitors of BCL2 with inhibitors of MCL1. And there's uh, literally dozens of clinical trials going on in that space now. A1 called BFL1 in humans, the pro-survival proteins has been implicated in T-cell acute lymphocytic leukemia. So it would be interesting to make BH3 mimetics that target this protein. Um, BH3 mimetic drugs might also be useful in the treatment of diseases other than cancer, like autoimmune diseases, where cells that shouldn't survive, survive and do damage, and possibly in infectious diseases by removing reservoirs of pathogen-infected cells. Um, and of course, um, it's also possible that um, if we could make agonists that directly activate the effectors of cell death backs and back, they might be useful in cancer therapy. Of course, their safety would have to be um, established. So this is the team of senior researchers who have contributed to the work that I present at least in part here and that I uh, thank for their uh, contributions and friendships over now more than 30 years. Suzanne Corey, Jerry Adams, David Vo, uh, Peter Coleman, the structure biologist, uh, David Wang, uh, Philippe Bouillet, uh, Claire Scott and Ruth Cluck. So, Thank you very much and um, good luck with your studies.